Thank you for sharing your Wednesday night with me. I am J.B. Bryan, President and Chief Investment Officer at J.B. Bryan Financial Group the home of Afroeconomics, a registered investment advisory firm. And I am excited about Life Insurance Awareness Month. If we have anything, we tend to have life insurance. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Y'all know it's the truth. We have a lot of life insurance in our community. And we have been sold life insurance like way before, like before they would even allow us to become stockbrokers and investment advisors and get, you know, these licenses that I have, they would allow us to buy life insurance. Isn't that interesting? And before that, they would even allow slave owners, slave owners, to get life insurance on black slaves. I, I'm, I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share screen, cause you know, there's always somebody who thinks that we're making stuff up. So we're gonna show, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't know why I keep saying life preparing. She's so right. She's like, why is it preparing? I don't have the slightest idea, so before, before I do, I don't know what, you know, how else to do it because it did it. I can stop it. I can stop. I can stop it. I don't know. I can't really, I can't really stop it. So those of you who thought that you were going to get it um, live, I'm, I'm going, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to stop the live and I'm not going to do Facebook. That's what we'll do. And I'll do YouTube. Right? Why, you know, why no, I'll do it. I'll try it one more time. Cause she cut, she cut, she cut my groove. We're gonna keep on moving, but only because I asked her to. I said, if you find out that I'm doing something wrong, please get loud and tell me what I'm doing wrong. So she was correct. That's a great producer. So we're talking tonight about the life insurance, our history as black customers, our history as black people buying life insurance before there were other in investment products that were we were allowed to own. Like people were able and allowed to, white slave owners were allowed to own life insurance policies on us before we could have a life insurance on ourselves. Elizabeth, how you doing, Ted? Good to see y'all. Yes, indeed, Mr. Clinton, they could. Says, Elizabeth said, my auntie used to pay the white guy that same, that same money religiously, and she still didn't have enough to take care of her final expenses. Isn't that the truth? Elizabeth had to get that out. And I think, I know I can say the same thing about family members where they came up to the house when, when, when they finally allowed us to get insurance. And when they would come up to the house and get that dollar or 25 cent or 50 cent or whatever it was a week and sell us that insurance policy. And by the time it was for the funeral, there was still wasn't enough money there you know, to pay for the funeral. And it is amazing when you look at it psychologically, Ethel, that, you know, Ethel said they collected that payment weekly, exactly. When you look at it psychologically, we have more, we had so much interest. And there was some book that I read that was talking about our obsession with how we are buried. Like, you know, how, how we're seen after um upon our death like if we had like a cheap burial or if we if we had a cheap funeral or if we had a really nice funeral you know that and if you had a really nice funeral then you had a good life like it was going to help us get into heaven so we would buy these policies because we felt like they were you know that that was how that if you had anything if you didn't have anything else if you have money for a nice funeral, then you were well represented. Your life was well represented. So we would spend all that money, and then we found out in many cases, we were being exploited. 
So I'm going to show you this article I have, Insure Pays Back Blacks and Poor, it says Blacks and Poor, it says Insure Pays Back Blacks and Poor. And then it says American General Corporation, the U.S. number three life insurer, agreed to pay $206 million to 9 million Black and poor Americans to settle accusations of overcharging them for insurance policies. Because they had, and look at how it says to settle accusations. Oh, so, oh, so they're just, just accusing you of this? No, there's research that shows that they had two different tablets. This is the tablet for the rate for Black people, and this is the tablet for the other people. That's the way it went down. And then it says, the Houston based insurer, which made almost 5 million Black customers pay, for, pay more for life insurance than whites, and also overcharged several million other low income families, even after discriminatory pricing was largely dropped by most insurers in the 1960s. See, it's tragic that this discrimination and exploitation occurred in the first place, but it's incomprehensible that this practice occurred up until a few days ago. That there were, you know, there were, you know, this is ridiculous. And this was printed by CBS News in June 21st, 2000. Come on, y'all. So then I want to show you this. This is in the New York Times. This is a New York Times article, and they're talking about insurance policies on slaves. This came out in 2016. You know, we need to be talking about this stuff. They're reading this, but how many of us are actually reading this? And that's why if anybody ever tells you that Afroeconomics is not important, then you should just smack them in the face. Don't participate with that type of person because they're crazy. If they don't think that it's important for us to know that insurance policies on slaves, this is, this is, this is relevant enough for New York Times to write an article on it. In 2016, but we don't think that we're supposed to understand the importance of building wealth within our community. In its 19th century beginnings, New York Life Insurance sold 508 policies covering slaves. Their, dependent, their de descendants are grappling with this. You no, know, because those slaves, like in this piece of paper, the one right here, this slave right there, can you see my pointer, Delia? Harriet, this is the guy who owned her, Adolph somebody, life insured was Harriet. What if that was Harriet Tubman? Isn't that amazing? And then it says that he bought insurance, she was 18, and he bought insurance for $11, and it was for a one-year term. Y'all, this is remarkable. This is here. This is in the book. This is held at the Stromberg Center for Research in Black Culture. These, this information is held there. It's there. So New York Life, the nation's third largest life insurance company, opened in Manhattan's financial district in 1845. Check this out. This is in 1845. In Richmond, Virginia, an enterprising New York Life agent sold more than 30 policies in a single day in February 1846. That's a year after they opened their New York office. Soon advertisements began appearing in newspapers from Wilmington, North Carolina to Louisville as the New York-based company encouraged Southerners to buy insurance to protect their most precious commodity, their slaves. Alive, slaves were among a white man's most prized possession, prized assets. Dead, they were considered virtually worthless. Life insurance changed that calculus allowing slave owners to recoup three quarters of a slave's value in the event of an untimely death. Look at this, this turn there, they're, they weren't making money. They said, let us go down south and let's start helping them insure the slaves. This company right now, but what, back then, they were known by Nauticus Mutual Life Insurance Company of New York. 
takes insurances on the lives of slaves running on steamboats or otherwise employed. Employed? The attention of slave owners is particularly called to this matter. Okay, they're gonna pay, you know, they're, that's interesting. It, look how they talked differently back then. That's amazing. This ad is taken out of, taken out by Nauticus Mutual Life Insurance in 1847 in Louisville, Kentucky, offering slave insurance policy. Nautilus was renamed New York Life Insurance in 1849. How many of y'all listening right now have policies with New York Life and you knew nothing about this? Interesting. So then it said New York Life's first president would later describe the American system of human bondage as evil. But by 1847, insurance policies on slaves accounted for a third of the policies in a firm that would become one of the nation, nations. But this, look at this. 1947, insurance policies on slaves accounted for one third. That's 33% of the policies for that firm that would become one of the nation's Fortune 500. I mean, in the most elite of our companies in this country. Wow, this New York Times, breaking it down. Mm, right, Georgetown, Harvard, and other universities have drawn national attention to the legacy of slavery. University of Virginia is doing that too. This year, as they have acknowledged benefiting from the slave trade and grappled with how to make amends. You know, they're trying to adjust, like they're trying to address it. Like, what do we, what do we owe? Because we built this company off slaves, off paying people for, you know, for just using people for free. Mm. Mr. Robinson said it's criminal and hypercritical. It, I don't have a policy with New York life. No, good for you. And give us our reparations. I know that's right. Hopefully they have um, black people on the committee, you know, to, to, do, to look at this legacy on slavery. Yeah, that's a good point, sister. The, um, and I don't know who the, each of, each of the institutions have like diff, different people, but the, um, but it's, you know, it's just sad. Look at this. Banks absorbed by J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo allow Southerners seeking loans to use their slaves as collateral and took possession of some of them when their owners defaulted. It's not something. They were using slaves as collateral to get loans. And when they didn't pay it back, mm, and it wasn't, and Wells Fargo, you know, that's a stretch because there was no Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is Wachovia, one of Wells Fargo's predecessors. I don't know, maybe it was. Yo, Wells Fargo, let's go with it. Because it says down here, it talks about Wachovia, one of Wells Fargo's, it, well, Wachovia went into Wells Fargo. So Wells Fargo is older than Wachovia. I didn't know that. So like New York Life, Aetna and US Life also sold insurance policies to slave owners. Aetna and U.S. Life, particularly those whose laborers engaged in hazardous work in mines, lumber mills, turpentine factories, and steamboats in the industrializing sections of the South. U.S. Life, a subsidiary of AIG, declined to comment on its slavery po slave policy sales. U.S. Life, don't you want to talk about it, huh? Wachovia, one of Wells Fargo's predecessor companies, has apologized for its historical ties to slavery, as has J.P. Morgan Chase and Aetna. You better, that's right. Apologize, but look, like he said, reparations. We need to figure out, we need to monetize that apology. Yeah, Bill Cosby didn't get to just say, I apologize, so you need to pay it up. Especially since you have it in writing, the company, the people, you have Harriet, well, they could have purposely not put Harriet's last name, but you know who, got that policy on Harriet. So you know what you're doing. You have a record of it. You can easily do reparations on that. More than 40 other firms 
mostly based in the South, sold such policies. Um, and this New York life survived. It says, um, its foray into slave insurance business did not prove to be lucrative. It was 33%. They're saying, though, that they were killing slaves and slaves were dying so much that they really couldn't make money off the policies because their mortality rate was so high. That's, what, that's the way you need to be explaining it in New York life. Yeah, Brandy said, this is horrible. Yeah, it is, especially considering the slave owners are responsible for the deaths. Exactly. Exactly. That's what twists me out. It's like, what were they like confused? Or did they really feel that maybe it, because they felt like they were putting the policy on it, but but that would be more likely that they would do more like insurance fraud. They were like, well, I'm gonna make at least this, you know, off the so I can just kill them and get my insurance money. If people do that for cars. You think they're not going to do that? You know, that they can just get another slave? That's disgusting. How to find companies, Elizabeth asks, how do I find companies whose hands are clean that never participated in this practice? Are there any? You know, well, any company that exists today has been bought and sold and switched, and they're just using their name. It's not even the same entity. This is some of these names are still being used, but you know, you, I, I would say that a company like the U.S. Life that said they didn't even want to apologize, you know, won't even make a statement, won't apologize, blatantly, and this, you know, that's a problem. These other ones who are like saying, you know, I, like they said, um, U.S. Life, a subsidiary of AIG, AIG, they declined to comment. I mean, seriously? But everybody else, you know, at least apologize. Well, Wachovia, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Aetna, you know, you would think, you know, they weren't involved in it. So even if you showed mercy on that, then, you know, that you can understand it. Even New York Life apologized. But it's just that we need to realize the economic impact of our business, that I don't care if they're saying it didn't end up being profitable. They made a lot of money that they needed in order for them to go into other areas that ended up being more profitable. So basically they still made a lot of money. When that man went out and he sold 30 policies in a day, you know, I, I'm, I'm not even, you know, going for that. You, you got that loan and you used, you, the, you just sold those policies. You got all that money. You're, you know, that that's profitable enough for that time period. Dr. Williams said, I was settled for 40 acres. They could keep the mule. I know that's right. They could keep it, they could adjust it and give me a tractor. The, the, now the descendants of one of those slaves who was recently identified by the New York Times, so that was, might have been Harriet, are coming to terms with the realization that one of the nation's biggest insurance companies sold policies on their ancestors and hundreds of other enslaved laborers. So they, and this policy number, 477, 447, oh, Nathan York, a slave who toiled in the Virginia coal mines where the earth often collapsed on its subterranean workforce. So it's saying like they were going down under and the, it would fall in on them. So they got these policies on them. So, and then they have the money. They tried to sue, but it says down in here, they, um, they did, they, they, um, the judge threw it out of court. So the, um, but it said New York Life hired one of the industry's first black agents in 1957, but the, but North Carolina Mutual hired the first black insurance agent. It uh, was one of the first black insurance agency, um, insurance companies. Af Af African Americans currently account for 13% of the firm's employees. And then I don't know why this, I guess they wanted to like save their advertising dollars. So they want to like start, start trying to make it, the company feel better. <laughs> but the, um, they, look, they didn't put it here, what the company donates to the Colin Powell Center for Policy. What in the world does that have to do with this, you know, these slave policies? So, and then they said they regret the policies in 1840s that are predecessor company. You know, see how they saying like it's, you know, nothing to do with them. While we cannot change our history, our longstanding recognition of it has helped 
shape our commitment to the African American community all because we built this thing. You were in there. Isn't that amazing that you only have 13% of your employees, but 33, over 30% of your business your, came from insuring slaves? But you only have 33% of descendants of slaves employed in the company. Mm. So the, that's, you know, that's it, it, it's a, the company's connection to slavery drew attention in the early 2000s. And then it comes down here to see where it said New York Life and other companies tied to slavery. The case, the lawsuit was dismissed in, 20, in 2004 after a judge ruled that the African American plaintiffs had established no clear link to the business they sued. Mm. And the statute of limitations had run out. Well, I guess it had. And he had the nerve to say more than a century ago. Oh my goodness. So that is extremely it's interesting. It says historians say that the slaves' policies had an impact on the company's development. The company had two years to invest or spend much of the revenues from the slave policies. This is what I was just saying before death claims exceeded annual minimal premiums. So they're saying also, this historian from Colgate University is saying that the slaves policy had an impact on the company's development. The policies helped New York life establish an early foothold in the South, which distinguished it from larger competitors, said Sharon Murphy, a historian at Providence College. Oh yes, definitely. It helped you a lot. Let's go back to our comments. That indeed. So uh, the Brandy, oh yeah, y'all, oh my goodness, go on and talk with your bad self. Y'all are just talking and I apologize. Y'all need to be on camera with me. I mean, raise your hand if you're gonna come on camera with me. And then the, all right, um, Brandy says, someone should make this an issue to be discussed right now during election time. Hold them accountable. JB, I'm gonna do it. Afroeconomics, that's why this is so important. I mean, not just from a consumer advocacy standpoint, but I just feel that we, we need to have a united economic representation. And I, I you know, am hoping that that's God's intention for Afroeconomics. Hopefully, and Elizabeth said, hopefully they have black folks on that committee. Okay, I'm gonna go on down, and then we'll go down to hold them accountable. That's what Brandy said. And then Mr. Robinson said, the, enslave, the enslavement owners literally worked our enslaved ancestors to death. Exactly, exactly. And then got paid off their lives. Tell them, Gary. And then Dr. Williams says, I'm old enough to remember the insurance guy going through my neighborhood, door to door, exactly, collecting $5 and recording the transaction in a record book that was about the size of an unabridged Webster's Dictionary. Isn't it true? I mean, it was just that big, right? <laughs> He said, unabridged. I mean, that's like the big one, right, Dr. Williams, right? That's a, oh, my goodness. They, um, and Ms. Tripp said, talk about blood money. This is at its best. OMG, it's a massive move if you have ever heard one. I know. I know. Ms. Cotman said, you are a blessing. Thank you. You have the right blend of everything. Oh, thank you. Ms. Tripp said, there is no statute of limitation on murder, and I'm betting many of these claims were made by slave owners that took the lives of their slaves. I know that's right. AIG is now Boya. I did not know that. Tell me something. Isn't that something? And, the, um, and I'm an insurance broker, but I don't, I don't do a lot of Boya. You know, I quote with companies, and if their company doesn't come out on top, then or I don't have any you know, reason why that's a better option for the client, I won't place it with them. But um, definitely, I insurance, I do insure, I have license in car, home, life, health, disability, I have license in all insurance products. I just focus more on investments, but I do help clients and members analyze their insurance coverages. Now, so the, and they, oh, they, you, they managed some stuff for you. Wow, that brings it home, right? 
Miss Granite said, I hate to see them coming to the house. <laughs> you say that too, I know, that's funny. My grandmother, my parents were like, or more the generation of like, they started paying through work, I guess. But the, um, my grandmother boy, yep. They even had recruited a cousin of ours and he was coming in, coming and collecting at that point. The, the, um, I've heard Minnesota Life, I've heard of Walmart taking insurance policies out on their employees. Whoa, that's scary. That's scary. Ms. Jones said Pfizer and various universities and medical organizations used and stole black bodies for profit. Whoa. Check out those sudden mass grave sites. Oh my God. Medical apartheid. That's sick. That's sick. And then sometimes I get insurance. You will be amazed. I was someone was asking me today, like, because people can, if they prove insurable interest, they can get insurance on you you know, um, pretty easily. So, you know, we do, and, and you can't check that on your credit report. Isn't that something? How you doing? How are you, Mr. Terry? How are you, Victoria? How are you, Miss White? I'm gonna share some tips before y'all get out of here. We gotta go over these tips on your insurance policies. That was, that, that was a brief look at history and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back, we'll go back to that um, as needed, but just, um, but just keep, I just thought that that was interesting, you know, that we, we, that so many things are happening and so many businesses in it benefited from our lives and, you know, and even the businesses that exploited us and then they paid us, paid us back. You know, think about how many businesses overcharged us, then went out of business, you know, and never paid any of the money back and were over or, or, the, uh, so many people that died that paid more into the policy than they actually got as a death premium out of the policy. So I want us to, the, here's a couple of tips. Review your insurance needs. Evaluate how much insurance you need. Determine how much you need. You know, so in evaluating it, you really need to decide like who will actually suffer from my, if I died today, who would, die, who would suffer? Do I have a joint car loan or a joint mortgage? Or do I have children that I need to educate and I don't have enough saved in order to do that? If you don't have the assets accumulated to take care of your responsibilities, then you need to investigate having insurance to cover that. But what happens all too often is we buy the insurance that, um, we're told is the appropriate one. So say you get a whole, uh, so you're sold on an insurance policy that will accumulate $100,000 in 10 years and you buy it, but the coverage is 200,000. I don't know, I'm just, and then it says 10 years, you'll have 100,000. So the, the cash value portion is the amount of extra. That's just you paying extra money in it to accumulate extra cash. They're not giving you anything. And we see it as they're giving you some money at the end. No, it's you have accumulated that through the extra payments that you've been paying into it. If you looked at the pure insurance costs, which is disclosed in the paperwork, it is a portion of what you are paying. So we have to get smart about if, if I'm paying for buying this extra insurance and I, this extra savings and I only have 200,000 in coverage, but I have two kids to educate and I really need more like a, a million or half a million at least, then you should be investigating how do I make sure that I get the half a million or the million that I need, right? Not just investigating that I'm going to get this possible lump sum because a lot of times you look at it and it says a lump sum offer but it's not even the guaranteed amount it's an amount that you might get because i had a, a member that came in one day and they were telling me about their policy i said bring the policy in and let me see that now they, they were paying this is not an exaggeration over five thousand dollars a month to this policy to buy the policy because they have promised them that they would have a particular promised amount at a set point of time. And they had it all in writing. 
So I said, this is not true. I looked at their policy, I looked at all the pages, it showed me the guaranteed amount. They had promised that they were gonna have like a million dollars at a particular time. And I said, no, the guaranteed amount at this particular time is just over 300,000. That's what they guaranteed that you will have in 10 years. I said, oh my goodness, no, that can't be true. I said, yes it is, let's call them. We call them, what is the guaranteed amount? And they tell them exactly what's in the policy. It says in that thing. So, but the agent had sold on a separate sheet of paper, this is the amount that you will get in a certain amount. And even though it, they pursued that and pursued that with regulators and everything, he never got his money back. All he could do was stop the policy. It was sad. It's sad and it was exploitation and it's wrong. I have another member, she went to the agent that she was using and she said, I need to update my beneficiary. He said, fine. He updated the beneficiary, switched her entire policy. Kept her premium the same, but it switched from $40 a month going into her cash value, but now she was older and a smoker and now only $10 but he used trickery. He kept the premium the same. And she came in there only to update the beneficiary. <clears throat> but I did not have confidence because of what the other client went, I didn't have enough confidence to tell her, you know what? I said, I told her, I said, you can try, you can go to the regulators, but I've seen this before and they don't do anything. It's sick, it's sick. They will say that you should have known. If I had not explained that to her, she would have never understood what he had done to her. I'm not even quite sure, you know, that she truly understands the thousands of dollars that he stole from her. Just to get additional commission. Just to get additional, he was still getting paid Whatever his company was paying, he was working for one of those big companies. You know, we still didn't pay, but not as much as I guess he would get paid by doing that new policy. Mm, 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 mm. That's so sick. And we don't know. So we need to assess our current life insurance policy. Know what you have. Know how it's working. Look at If not, that's what you use your quarterly meetings for. Join Afro Economics. And that's in something that is totally about your betterment. Compare the different kinds of insurance policies that are available and, and, and pick them according to your need and your budget, not based on what the agent is selling to you. And be sure that you can afford what has been set out for you. I mean, there are so many people who switch from one policy to the other and go to an inferior policy. Inferior. That, look, so get the proper help. And then, look, if, if, if you have a policy and you've had the policy for a while, it's generally good for you to hold on to that policy and, and consider layering on top of that policy if you need additional coverage. Because there is a waiting period, generally with policies, where they can just give you back what you have paid into the policy if you pass away within those first two years. So you don't really have a policy policy until after that waiting period of getting past those first two years. That's kind of the margin of error. Like they might've missed out that you were really sick and you didn't know it. They couldn't catch it. You ain't go to the doctor and it wasn't in the chart. So they said, well, you better live two years. You ain't gonna get this. We just gonna give you back what you put in. So find out what your waiting period is, but uh, normally it's at least a year. And then understand what the renewals are. Do you have a five-year term, 10-year term, 20-year term? What type of policy do you have? What, what if you have term? If you have um, permanent, is it a universal? Is it variable universal? Is it a whole life? What happens if you miss a payment, right? So read the policy carefully and read over everything. You know, I suggest at least once a year, understand everything about your life insurance policies. Understand it, make a commitment to it. You deserve it. Y'all are talking, <laughs> yes. What, what do they say? 
to Miss Freeman. Hi, Miss Freeman. Oh, I, I'm here for you, Miss Freeman. She said we. Oh, Miss Miss Freeman is enjoying it. We hear you. Thank you, Delia. That's indeed. Mr. Terry said he got paid more because the premium was higher. Actually, Mr. Terry, in that example, I was saying when the lady came in to change her beneficiary, the um, he kept her premium the same. Isn't that crazy? But he adjusted. He kept the premium. He said, "Oh, look." Um, you know, so she signed everything because everything was coming out the same. But what happened is it adjusted. He created a new policy. He didn't want additional premium. He wanted that new policy. So it would count towards his bonuses and stuff. Yep. And so when she renewed at a higher age, when she was misled into getting a new policy at a higher age and a smoker, then more was, yeah, more was going to pay for the insurance. That's right. The premium for the insurance, you're right, was higher. And that's probably what you're saying. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the premium. So out of the $60, her insurance was now $50 versus her insurance portion before was $20 and 40 was going towards savings. And then when she was misled into renewing, it was $60 the same, but the insurance portion of it was now 50 and only 10 was going to not hypothetically, you know, the going to the, um, the cash value. So it slowed down her cash accumulation drastically just for going in to update a beneficiary. Be aware of what you're doing. Don't, you know, be very careful. That is so sad. How are you, Jennifer? How are you, Dr. A? How are you? Any questions before y'all leave me? So bottom line is we have to be smart, be conscious, check up. Every, hi, everybody on the phone. How you doing, Mr. Yarbrough? How are you, Fonda? I'll see you soon. Hi, Francine. I appreciate y'all. Hi, hi Ms. Buzzy. I see. Bussy, I should say. <laughs> Mr. Lewis, my friend, Ms. Turner. Y'all doing okay? Thank you. That is Afro Economics Tonight. It is Insurance Life Insurance Awareness Month. Remember, I am on your team. What is your take on term versus whole life insurance? Before I go, where is the term versus whole life? I think that, I think that there is a place in our life for either one but it has to be correct. There are some people who need to have term because they need to maximize coverage. Some people that need to have permanent or whole life policy because they want to maximize the savings potential of it. You know, so they need, they're, they're, you just have to know your specific goal and your specific budget because you can get a whole lot more insurance with term. So if you need a maximum amount of protection and you only have $300, then you're going to get a lot more protection theoretically with a term policy, but that term policy will end at the end of that term. That whole life will lock it in. So one way of looking at it is always have consider having a base permanent policy so say, you know, and combine it with term policy so that you at least will cover those middle years where you're trying to educate or pay the house off or when you have the maximum amount of debt, then you can have the term to make sure that the term covers it. But you got to stick to the plan. If the plan is to cover, pay those debts off in that particular term, you got to do it. Yes, indeed, Mr. So Yarbrough. Oh, you stay blessed as well. Yes, indeed. May you always receive a blessing, all of you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your questions. Email me, jv at jvbryan.com. Uh, Mr. Terry says, scratch hole all together. Annuities make more sense. Saving wise, in my, in my opinion. Annuities are a, a savings tool, an investment tool, where the whole life, it actually gives you life insurance. So, and people do that and they should not do that. <clears throat> Use insurance for insurance. Use annuities that are owned by insurance companies, but they are not a life insurance policy. So um, definitely, 
you know, that that we um that that their whole life insurance and annuities nowhere near are there are not the same thing. They're just may be owned by the same life insurance company, but definitely um, life insurance is life insurance. Permanent life insurance is permanent life insurance. So you take that $20 a month and you can get that $200,000 of coverage depending on what your age is, but you put $20 a month into an annuity, you are not going to get that $200,000 until you grow that individual payment. So that life insurance gives you that boom, that balloon. You're, you're buying access to that upon your death. You're getting that lump sum. You know, the annuities are guaranteed that amount that you put in upon your death, but that's totally different than life insurance. I hope I've explained that correct, you know, to that you can understand, but ask me for additional details on the difference between life insurance and annuities. It definitely is a difference. Please send a link from discussion about slave owners and insurance policies. Indeed. What was that? The, um, oops, uh, oops, those are my notes. I'm going to show you this. Mm, the, I'm going to give it to you now because I hate to tell you I'm going to do something I don't. The, it's the New York Life. Oh, here it is. New York Times, I just have it deep into the article. It starts with the brown. It's New York Times, I'm sorry. New York, New York Times, nytimes.com, 2016, 12, 18. Insurance policies on slaves, New York life's complicated past. Insurance policies on slaves, New York life's complicated past. That helped. Can you copy and paste it? And oh, that's a good idea. No, look at y'all. I know I taught y'all well. Look at that. My people with the high techness. That's right. There you go. Woo! We are maximized because that's why it pays to be in the webinar. <laughs> Thank you. Great idea. Thank you. Yeah. No. And I mean, isn't it nice? To have something to refer to the me just sitting here sharing with you my opinion and what has happened you know it gives us that then that will lead to different references and that that's power in that that's what we want that's what i want that's you know i just thank god for using me this way to to, to as a catalyst for information that that you know, hopefully will empower you to empower someone else you know we got to give more we got to give more Encourage your 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 um, friends, your family, to join Afroeconomics, even if they just need to do the no excuse membership to to get in the door. But um, we need this connection. Yeah, we need it, and you deserve it. Thanks, everybody. You all are the best. Thank you. I appreciate you. I really do. Thank you, Denise. I'm glad that you got logged in. <laughs> good to see you, Craig. Good, good to see you. Good night, Kathy. Good night, Dr. A. Good night, Jennifer. Good night, Sharon. Good night, Tay. Good night, Mr. Martin. Good night, Tina. Good night, Mr. Jones. Victoria, I see you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Night. See, see you soon. That's right. Good night, Dr. Williams. Miss Greenwich, I hope you're feeling better. How you doing, Benita? It's a good day. Miss Witherspoon, I got your email and I'm working on that. That flyer, I'm going to be um, with, um, I have a huge, huge um, speaking opportunity coming up in DC and I'm going to get that. I want to add that to our website so we can start. Um, I am one of the million. And um, that I want to share that information with you all. I'll send that out so that we can have it. It's going to be in Northern Virginia, right outside DC. And uh, Afro Economics is going to bring, bring it. So I need y'all to come out and support. We're going to get y'all all the way up there. Get you to the nation's capital. Yes. Thank y'all so much. I'll have that information, I promise, next week. It's, um, it's going to be October 13th. Indeed. Good night.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. See y'all soon. Celebrate and power. That's right, Sharon. Bye-bye.